The Berlin Blockade, or Berlin Airlift, is one of the most significant events in the foundation of the Cold War. Um, the causes are actually multi... There's lots of different factors in the causes of it, one of which is the 1945 elections in Austria, which I failed to mention in my previous Cold War video, so I'm kind of getting it in here now. Uh, the Communists win only four of 165 seats. Now, this is particularly important because, as you can tell, it's a really, really small number, and this means that Stalin kind of tightens his grip on the rest of Europe. Now, in 1946, the 25% of resources that the Soviet Union is supposed to get from the Western zones is just gone. The Allies just don't give the Soviet Union those that percentage from their zones anymore. The main reason being is they didn't want to give the Soviet Union stuff that their zones could not support, which kind of makes sense, but annoys Stalin nonetheless, which is the kind of the problem. And now we move into 1947 with the Truman... We move in... To the, we're moving with the Truman Doctrine and that kind of thing. So we get the Truman Doctrine first, which is all about um, containing communism using American means, which is effectively money and weapons. Well, money, weapons and soldiers. But soldiers isn't particularly important. But money and weapons are to be used mainly in China with the support of Chiang Kai-shek's army against Mao Zedong, which eventually leads to um, Chiang Kai-shek being defeated. Also, they give money and support to the Greeks in the Greek Civil War to help destroy the communists, which they think Stalin is interfering with, but he's actually not. And also in France's struggle with the Viet Minh in the 1950s. But this is kind of irrelevant for what I'm going to talk about, but it's useful background information anyhow. And then we move on to the Marshall Plan or the European Recovery Plan, which basically, which basically is 17 billion that is given to Western Europe to help rebuild its economies. But one of the ties of this is that a part of it, or sorry, is part of it will be respent buying American goods. Because what you've got to remember is that at the end of 1945, America's economy is incredibly strong, and what they suddenly have is they have a whole load of weapons and a whole load, and they've got a wartime economy running with a lot of goods that they therefore cannot sell. So part of this is to kind of ease America's economy back into a post-war into a post-war economy and a peacetime economy. So that's also quite important. Now I move into 1948. At this point, the control of Eastern Europe is virtually set. In Czechoslovakia, you've got the end of um, the coalition government and the communist government takes trials. Benes is forced to resign. And also in 1948, the extension of the Marshall Plan is given... Um, to West Germany, which means that West Germany can benefit from martial aid. Now, another cause is that Britain and America joined zones, their zones of Germany are joined in 1947 to form by Zonia to centralise the economies. Now, this is for a number of reasons, namely that America has a great economy and Britain doesn't. Britain's struggling because a lot of refugees from the eastern areas of Europe are coming into that area of Germany. You've also got the failures of um, colonialism because of Britain are losing their colonies, particularly India at this point. And also, as I think I've said earlier, Britain are in a lot of debt and it gains 3.75 billion from the US in 1945. This is pre-Marshall Plan 8, but it's got to pay back at 2% interest per annum, which is a lot. And I don't think the full amount is actually paid off till about 2006. So it's a lot. Now, now we move on to 1948, where the Benelux nations, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, meet with Britain, France, and the US in two sessions in London to kind of discuss what the future is for Germany, or should I say their zones of Germany. We cannot call it West Germany because it is not West Germany yet. And basically all the conference decides is that West Germany should not be able to invade the Soviet zone and the kind of nuclear weapons. Now, as a result of this conference, which does not include the USSR, the USSR stops using the Allied Controlled Council, which is supposed to be the governing body of all four zones of Germany, but it kind of doesn't work. And also in 1948, the Soviets start checking the identities of all British and American passengers entering Berlin. They start basically harassing people entering Berlin because they're trying to kind of force the Western Allies out of it. And on, the, and on the 25th of March, they start announcing restrictions on military and passenger cargo. Then on the 1st of April, they start making sure cargo can't leave Berlin without asking the Soviet commander. Now, the Allies take one big step now, which is incredibly important, into uh, further increasing Cold War tensions. Now, after 1945, the Reichmark, which is the currency that is bought in in 1924 to ease off spending, or sorry, is to solve hyperinflation, you know, through the Dawes Plan and that kind of, through the Dawes Plan, um, is failing. The Soviets are basically printing too much of it and the currency is becoming worthless. It's devalued because they want a very, very weak Germany. And the Allies don't want that. They want a strong Germany that is able to buy their goods. So they decide to make a new currency, which is called the Deutschmark. And there's a bit of a problem with the Deutschmark and the fact the Soviet Union don't like it. They're not even invited to the conference. 
And they announce it, they announce the Deutsche Mark as a new currency in Germany, but the Soviets refuse it. Now, the Allies decide to airlift 250,000 Deutsche Marks into Berlin. And this is to be ordered into their zone to Berlin in order to be spent. But the Soviets don't like it. And on the 22nd of June, which is about four days after uh, the Allies have announced the Deutsche Mark, they announced something called the East German Mark, or West Germans call it the Ostmark, and said that, that would only be permissible, that would be the only permissible currency in Berlin. And the Deutsche Mark is not only considered um, currency that is illegal, uh, currency that cannot be spent, but it's also illegal, which is another problem. On the 24th of June, the Soviets severed land and water connections between the Western zones and Berlin, which means the only way of getting from uh, West or the Western zones of uh, Germany to the Western zone to Berlin is through like one rail network and that kind of thing. The Soviets stopped supplying food on the 25th of June to the non-Soviet zones in Berlin. And this, you can kind of see where the beginning of the blockade is coming. And basically the 26th of June, around that area is when it officially begins. West Berlin had only 36 days of food and 45 days worth of coal, which means they were having to capitulate pretty quickly if they were going to. But General Clay, who was in charge, kind of comes up, kind of gets the idea of an airlift. And as there's been a mini airlift already in trying to move military things uh, into Berlin, and there's and the RAF have got a lot of planes in Britain which can easily be moved to Germany, an airlift becomes a lot more plausible. However, they decide to speak to um, a guy called Willy Brandt, who's the aide to the leader of... Um, were the Western zones in Berlin at the time, and they basically say, well, we are going to try and airlift, but your people will go hungry and they will go cold and they will suffer from lack of electricity. Is this permissible? And he says, yes. So the airlift begins. Now, what you've got to remember is the Western Allies have a very, very limited post-war army. The Americans had roughly 9,000 men in their zone. Britain had roughly seven... This is zones in Berlin, by the way. Britain had roughly 7,600 men. The French had uh, 6,000 men. The US had only 98,000 men in West Germany or, the, or its zone in West Germany. And to start the delivering, and they're kind of making up this by using B-52 bombers. Now, B-52 bombers are bombers that are capable of carrying a nuclear bomb, which is like kind of like, oh my God, sort of news. Because obviously atomic bombs equals Third World War, which is what they're trying to avoid. Now, the Soviet Union had 1.5 million men in their sector of Germany because the Soviet Union haven't done the post-war demobilization that... Um, the Western Allies have. Now, there are three 20-mile-long air corridors into Berlin, which have been agreed at the Potsdam Conference, and the Allies used them basically to shuttle food into Berlin. Now, the, air, the airlift was actually genius, because unlike trucks, cargo aircraft are dis distinctly donated as cargo aircraft, so the Soviets couldn't shoot them down and claim their military aircraft. And obviously, if they'd marked as humanitarian aircraft, then to shoot them down would be breaking the Soviets' own rules, so they'd look like idiots, and... Um, so they basically had no choice but to back down and not do, it, do anything. <laughs> At the beginning of the airlift, the US had C-47s, which could supply 3.5 tonnes per aircraft, which equates to roughly 300 tonnes for all aircraft, and the RAF had aircraft that could supply 400 tonnes, which equates to around 700 tonnes, which is not 5,000 tonnes, which was needed to supply Berlin per day. 5,000 tonnes a day. Um, this was co-named Operation Vittles by the US and Operation Plainfare by the UK. They've got different names, basically, um, depending on the country. American aircraft would go th through the American um, air corridor, Tempelhof Airport, and then back through the British corridors. Tempelhof Airport, the runways originally collapsed under the weight of the C-47s. The new C-47s they found could only do um, 10, which could carry 10 tonnes. So they had to, American engineers had to build new runways for them, 1948. You've also got Teagle Airport, which is built... I think for the British, but anyway, the airport is built hastily by 19,000 West Berliners in three months, which is a pretty impressive feat. And basically what they're trying to do, they're trying to get as many planes to land in West Berlin as possible as to, be, as to supply the city and mean it doesn't need to rely on East German aid. The Allies managed 90 tonnes a day for the first week and then 1,000 tonnes a day the next week. Now do remember, they've got around 36 days worth of food anyway, so you know if the airlift doesn't run as smoothly to begin with, it's not the end of the world for the West Berliners. Now, as we get closer to winter, it gets to be a bit of a problem. Now, rules, as, as, as there were a couple of accidents in the winter, some rules are brought in. They can only fly in reasonable visibility, which kind of limits the time, particularly in the winter, of what they can do. And each pilot had a set time to land. If they missed that time, they were told to return to their base. Now, the Berliners made up for the lack of manpower in unloading the aircraft. They would just help unload all the planes and distribute everything. Remember, you've got food, you've got fuel, you've got that kind of thing. Medicine, that, that is all the stuff that is given to West Berliners. 
Now, I'm just going to sidetrack a little and talk about a pilot called Gail Haverson, who was one of the pilots of the Little Vittles. Now, the Little Vittles was basically a, um, was started by Gail Halverson, Halverson, sorry, and he would supply chocolate and sweets to children at the airport. And the story begins that he had some Whitley's uh, chewing gum with him and he had a bunch of kids around him. And he basically said that if you agree to distribute all this gum evenly, the next time I will bring more. And the children said, well, how are we going to know? And he said he dropped them in parachutes and that kind of thing. So he used to drop chocolate and sweet to the children. They used to obviously get really happy. And it kind of, you know, it furthered the good propaganda image of the Western Allies. And eventually, and his senior officer didn't like it, but some other higher ups did. And so it continued. Other pilots used to do this. And this is why the airmen are partly considered like heroes, despite the fact they never actually were in a combat mission. Now, at which point, after about four or five months, the Soviet Union realised that things aren't going their way. They haven't forced the Western Allies out of Berlin. So they say anybody, they can, anybody can get free food if they get the ration books registered in East Berlin. But the West Berliners, or should I say the West Berlin government, basically say, no, this can't happen. And... Then we enter a process about the denazification. Basically, denazification is a process in which uh, individuals, mainly in the Western states, will kind of cleanse of Nazism, not suffering for their crimes. But I'll do more about that later. Anyway, ex Luftwaffe crews, ex Luftwaffe crews, we used to look after the planes. Now, as we approach the winter, the tonnage increases to six thousand tons a day due to more coal needed to basically um, supply electricity and that kind of thing. Um, by the 21st of April 1949, the amount of supplies bought in exceeded the amount borne in by rail before the blockade. So as you can see, the airlift is obviously working. The blockade ends on the 12th of May 1949, but food was still flown in on West, Je West Berlin on weekends and so forth. So it had a three-month surplus in case the airlift was needed to commence again. At its height, a plane landed once every 30 seconds. There was 101 fatalities, which were mainly due to plane crashes, and the cost was between $2.23 billion to $4.98 billion in today's money. The breakdown of food that actually needs to be flown in daily was 646 tonnes of flour and wheat, 125 tonnes of cereal, 64 tonnes of fat, 109 tonnes of meat and fish, 180 tonnes of dehydrated potatoes, 180 tonnes of sugar, 11 tonnes of coffee, 19 tonnes of powdered milk, 5 tonnes of whole milk for children, 3 tonnes of fresh yeast for baking, 144 tonnes of dehydrated vegetables, 38 tonnes of salt, which equates to something like 1,534 tonnes, of food and an extra 3,475 tonnes of coal and gasoline were required daily. And there were 2 million people in Berlin. So as you can see, there was a lot to do. And it's one of the biggest aviation feats in history to deliver that much per day. Thank you for listening.